who I hate. Okay, maybe that's a heavy-handed way to start a message, right? Okay, you have a hard time not hating, all right? It's people who mistreat my kids. Can I get an amen from the parents in the room? Yeah, isn't that hard? Man, most of the time, you know, it's like an uh, unfair teacher. And if you're a teacher, you're probably saying you're an unfair parent, right? Or if it's a coach who obviously my son's better than his son, but he puts his son in and not my son. What's he thinking, right? But who I really have the hardest time with, as crazy as this is going to sound, you know, you go to church and you sing your songs and you give and you serve and you open the door and you got your Jesus face on, you know, and you're all happy. And then you leave church and you go out to Hat Creek with your family. If you made Hat Creek, God bless you. We love you. You go to Hat Creek and they got the playground right and your kids are all playing. I got five-year-old, three-year-old, so context, okay? So they're out there playing and they're, and then when another kid mistreats my kid, I do not want to treat them like Jesus would treat them. It is difficult. Man, I don't, it drives me crazy. And here's the thing. You can treat me so well. You could sing me songs. And you could give me money. You could buy me presents. And you could praise my holy name. But if you mistreat my kids, it doesn't really matter to me how you treat me. Sorry, I just had to get that off my chest. Okay. So if you've missed any of the past few weeks, we're in a brand new series starting off. A brand new year called Brand New because we're super creative. And uh, these messages are all about how we view Christianity and what it means to be a Christ follower. And over the past few weeks, we've been saying that Jesus came to start something you got it, brand new, and that the arrival of Jesus, because it meant something would be brand new, meant that something would end. And what we talk about over this series is that what would end, what Jesus would invite us to walk away from, is the temple model way of doing religion or seeking God. And you see this not just in Judaism, but all over the world. It's not a new thing. This is thousands of years old, this temple model. Here's what it says. The basic tenets of it is there are always sacred places, some place, some geographic location, a building, some dirt somewhere where you go, and that place is better because God's there. And then there's sacred texts. You know, there's always a a document or an inscription or some writing somebody wrote, and it it tells about how to see God in the world and sin. And then there's always, in the temple model, there's always sacred men, and in this model, it's always men, right? And these men interpret these texts, and they tell you how to be right with God, and then there's sincere followers or scared followers or, in some cases, scarred followers or superstitious followers who listen to these sacred men, talk about these sacred texts in these sacred places. And for years, this was the model, thousands of years, this was the model, and in some cases still is the model of how to connect with God. And Jesus came and initiated something entirely different, something brand new. And Jesus would say that we have a new covenant or a new agreement with God. A new command. And the old covenant, the old command, there's 600 plus ways that you can get God to be mad at you by doing something you shouldn't do, so you better pay attention. In Jesus' way, there's really only one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. A new ethic in, in Jesus' brand new way, how you were doing vertically was directly connected to the integrity of how you were doing horizontally with the people in your life. And this would be a new movement that would literally turn the world upside down. But what we talked about last week is that we are led by our conscious. And our consciousness informs our behavior. And so we kind of grown up in an environment, maybe some of you grew up in church, Compass at Home, maybe you, you didn't grow up in church at all, but you grew up in a country that was informed by the church. And in this model that we kind of grew up and around, and for some of us are still in, in this model, a lot of what we do is, is a little bit of Jesus and a little bit of temple. A little bit of the way Jesus taught the disciples to live in this brand new way of doing things. And a little bit of temple. And that leads us to being ineffective in our pursuit of God. Unaffected and lose influence as people and as a church. And so we said last week, what we're going to do is we're going to let go of some of the things that are holding us back so we can embrace what Jesus wants us to embrace in 2021. 
So we gave some examples. Here's a few from last week. Number one, if you feel guiltier about missing church than you do mistreating someone at work, that's temple thinking. If you sit around wondering how you can get away with sin, how close you can get to sin without actually sinning, what's a sin, what's not a sin, that's temple thinking. If you believe there's some ritual that you can do, something you can do to get right with God so that you'll be right with God, and in that it lets you off the hook and making it right with someone that you've hurt or sinned against or harmed, that is temple thinking. It's all temple thinking, and here's why. Temple thinking model, temple thinking model is you-centered. It's you-centered. It's me-centered. At the heart of the temple model, it's really all about you and it's really all about me. Because the heart of the temple model aims to answer one question. What must I do or what must I believe to make things and keep things right between God and me? And in the onset, this seems like a really good question. Right? How do I please God? How do I get God off my back? But the real motive behind this question most of the time is so that my family will be good. So that my business will be good. So that my life will be good. How do I get God off my back so that I can feel good about me, 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 me? And if we see God as some kind of cosmic killjoy, you know, like if I mess up and if I don't do that right thing or follow those right rules or live according to those right rituals, if we see God as some kind of cosmic killjoy ready to just, just strike us down every time we make a mistake, then what happens is we end up living a life that looks over our shoulders. Every time something bad happens, something goes on with your kids, Something, a business decision doesn't go the way you want, to, want it to. Something happens at work or with your marriage. Every time something doesn't go the way that we want it to go, we always look back to this question and say, well, I guess I did something wrong and God's getting me back and I must deserve it. That is called karma, not Christianity. And it's the temple model way of thinking. For some of us, it, it shows itself in how we pray. God bless my family. God help me and my kids and watch over me and bless my day. Me, 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 my, my, my. For some of us, it's why we attend church. Hey, God, do you see what I did last Sunday? I sat in church. I sang the songs. I dropped something in the bucket. God, you, Now, God, we're not talking about what I did on Friday. That's not a part of the deal. Just ignore Friday. Let's talk about Sunday. I was there on Sunday, so we should be good. For some of us, it's why we give. For some of us, it's why we obey. And it looks God-centric. But at the end of the day, this approach to religion and the approach to Christianity is all about you. For some of us, you've even said this. You said, I got to get back to church. I need to get back in church. Because if I get back in church, then my, my life will get all back together. And my family will get back together. And that is not a bad thing. It's great. But I, it, it's all centered around the same thing. Me, 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 my, 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 I, I, I. Temple, not Jesus. The reason this model is so destructive is because temple thinking always gravitates towards rituals and rules. Temple thinking, even a Christian version of temple thinking will always lead you to what is the answer to the question, what exactly must I do? Exactly. Now we've added a word. These rituals and rules now make it precise because I've learned how to play the game. I've learned that if I do right things, right things happen. If I do bad things, bad things happen. And that's the way the universe works. Right, right, right. We get what we deserve. Right, right, right. Temple thinking. So now we zero in. What exactly must I do to make things right and keep things right between God and me. And maybe that's a good question if, if, to start with in your Christian faith. But at some point, spiritual maturity answers the question in an entirely different way and asks entirely different questions. If you spend the rest of your Christian experience trying to get God's attention, trying to keep God happy, make God tune in, get God to answer your prayers, it's temple thinking. And it'll ultimately lead you to embracing the wrong thing. It'll ultimately stifle your maturity in God because temple thinking is all about rules and rituals. 
It's all about us trying to figure out exactly what we got to do. And it's loophole thinking that focuses on my works instead of the finished work of the cross. It's not grace. It's not gospel. It's temple. So what happens? Rituals and rules, and I went to the place on Sunday, and I read the book a few times, and I prayed two days this week, and I, I said the whole, you know, God is good, God is great, thank him for what's on the plate. I did the whole thing, God, I did all that. What that does is it creates loopholes. What that does is it creates escape clauses, right? And what do those things called cause? They cause hypocrisy. Well, God, I did all the things, you know, I went to the building, I prayed the prayer, I read the book, so I'm, yeah, I mistreated her, but that doesn't really matter because I did all the right things and me and you were good, right? It creates hypocrites. And the reason so many of you compass at home don't want to step foot in a church sometimes, the reason so many of us in the building had to be drug here with our arm twisted, a lot of times is because of this same hypocrisy. Someone invites you to church, someone down the road or someone at work or someone in school invites you to church and they do all the right rituals, but they treat people terribly and you look at their life and you say, I treat people better than you. More people want to be around me than want to be around you. Maybe you need church more than I do. <laughs> Why would I go to your thing? It looks like it's not even working out for you. But God in Christ has asked us to abandon this way of thinking. Because for Jesus, religion is not about you. The Jesus model centered on the you beside you. Look at your neighbor say, it's all about you. It's all about you. Look at him. Come on, say, it's all about you. That's good news, right? It's all about you. It's not about me. It's about the you beside you. And that sounds really good in a sermon. It looks really good on a screen, but here's what it means. It means if you're a Democrat, that you is the somebody who's on the right of you. And if you're a Republican, that you is somebody who's on the left of you. And if you're a racist, it means that that you, that your faith has got to be about, is the person that you don't want to have anything to do with. And that's why tomorrow is not just a day off. Tomorrow is about something so much more. Tomorrow is the day we teach our kids about the history of our country and the power and Dr. King's legacy tomorrow is so much more. It's about weeping about what was, weeping about how far we've come, and weeping about how far we have to go as a nation because there are some who view ritual as escape clauses to the detriment of how they treat others. And you can't say, I'm a Christian and I hate blank people. You just can't. You just can't do it. An invitation to follow Jesus is an invitation to leave what's all about you and embrace what's beside you, the who beside you. And this is all throughout the New Testament. Jesus said it this way. He, uh, he said, my command is this, one, singular, only one, one, one command. The Bible's a big book. Yeah, one command. Love each other. As I have loved you, Paul would say it this way in Galatians chapter 5. He'd say, the only thing, singular thing, only thing, the one thing. You say the same thing to Paul. Paul, the Bible's a real book. The only thing, Paul would be like, yeah, I wrote most of it. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. He'd say in Galatians 5, 14, for the entire law, you start your Bible reading plan in January. You start in Genesis. You get all the way through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, all the way through Malachi. You start the New Testament, Matthew. You read all the way through Revelation. You get to the very end. You say, spark note it for me. Somebody make all this make sense. Paul says, okay, everything you just read is fulfilled in keeping one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. That represents a complete departure from temple thinking. Okay, few few questions for you. Do you know why you should tell the truth? You know why you should tell the truth? You go, oh, yeah, Josh, of course I know. I should tell the truth because it's in the Bible, right? Thou shalt not lie. Jesus had one commandment. Moses wrote 10 long before that. Thou shalt not lie was one of them. I paid attention in Sunday school. I get a medal for that, right? Yeah, it's in the Bible. We shouldn't lie because God will get angry, and he wrote the Bible. We don't want to make God angry. We talked about what happens, and we make God angry, so I'm not going to lie because I don't want to make God angry. Wrong. That's temple thinking. That's not the Jesus way. 
The reason we don't lie is because me lying about you undermines your value and God created you and Jesus died for you. The reason I don't lie to you or about you to anybody else is because the whole thing of Christianity is about you. It's because you matter to God. And I'm not going to lie about you, not so that I keep God off my back because I'm a person of honesty. I'm not going to lie about you because I care about you. That's why I don't lie. You know why you should be generous? You know why? Oh, Josh, I know there's something in the Bible that says if I give a dollar, God will give me ten. I like ten better than one. It's good math. No. You were born in America. You got your ten when you were born. If you're born in Texas, you got your ten and a Bible and a gun. <laughs> no. Well, you know, it's like, I, I got to give because God said give. And something about cheerful giver and it'll make him happy if I give. No, 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 no. That's temple thinking. I am not generous to get God's attention and to keep God happy. Jesus got God's attention for me on the cross. Jesus made God happy for me. God was happy when he created me. He said in Genesis when he made all mankind, it's a good thing. No, generosity is not about God. Generosity is about the person that I'm generous to. To. It's about the people that the organization I'm generous to is helping make their life better. I give because God cares about the person that I'm giving to, and so do I. Do you know why you should not talk bad about someone else? Yeah, because it's in the Bible. Don't gossip. God gets mad when we gossip. We talk bad about people. God gets angry. Don't want God angry. You know why you shouldn't leave church today and go to Olive Garden and have me for lunch with your pasta fajoul? Is it because God said so and he'll get mad if you talk bad about me? No, he will get mad if you talk bad about me. He told me that on good authority, so don't talk about me. No. You don't gossip because, because when I gossip, I am elevating myself to your denigration. I am lessening your credibility with other people when I gossip about you. I don't gossip and talk bad about you because maybe I care about you and want your life to be better. If I'm going to talk about you, it's going to be good things other than my counselor's office. That's off limits. I talk about y'all there all the time. It's not always good. Just joking. <laughs> kind of. Do you know why you should not pressure your girlfriend or boyfriend sexually? Because in the Bible, Josh, is sex is for marriage. And it's in the Bible, if you do bad things morally, your life won't work out. Later on, you'll pay a price for it. You'll be doing everything great, and then all of a sudden, somewhere out of nowhere, something bad will happen, and you'll remember something you did way back then with a boyfriend or girlfriend. You'll say, well, I guess I deserved it. My hens have come to roost, and whatever kind of karma sayings that you want to say that are temple model and not Jesus thinking, none of those are the reasons why. You don't sexually pressure your girlfriend or your boyfriend. No, you don't pressure someone sexually because as a Christ follower, you should never be the main subject of someone's counseling sessions when they're putting their broken life back together. As, as a Christ follower, it's not okay for me to say, God, I prayed a prayer and ask you to forgive me, and me and you were right, and then I can move on. No, 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 no. The, the problem with that way of thinking is she's not right. She's not all right. She's got a broken life over here, but because you prayed a prayer and did a ritual, now you can just move on. No, 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 no. That is temple model thinking. And do we really need to go any deeper? Let's just be honest and love your neighbor as yourself. Do we really need a verse for every single thing when Jesus said it's all about love God and love your neighbor as yourself? I've been a pastor for, for a long time. I've been in a lot of churches. I've been in churches of a couple hundred people. I've been in churches of 20,000 people, right? And I have had a lot of meetings with people that have went something like this. Pastor Josh, we're leaving the church. Well, why are you leaving the church? It's just not deep enough. Listen, I've been in churches with great youth ministry, great kids ministry. The singing's amazing. I mean, obviously the preaching's always good. Um, and, and, and we'll have these meetings, and it's like, well, the church is just not deep enough. And I'm like, so let me ask you a question. You want me to confuse you more with Greek and Hebrew? Yes, I want you to confuse me with Greek and Hebrew. You want me to go into all these obscure verses and random theologies and how it all ties? Yes, that's what I want you to do. You want an hour of worship every Sunday? Yes, that's what I You don't even come to church when it rains, right? But you want an hour in worship on Sunday? 
Yes, I want more Greek and Hebrew, confuse me with theology and sing 10 songs. That's the church I'm looking for. Okay, let me ask you two questions and then you're free to go. Here's two questions. Number one, what's the first commandment Jesus gave? And everybody who wants it to go deeper always knows the answer to that question. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's just what I'm trying to do, Josh. Well, here's the second one. You ready? You taking notes? All right, it's a tough one. What's the second commandment? Love your neighbor as yourself. You got it, right? All right, here's my follow-up application question, and then you're free to go. What's your neighbor's name? You know the person who lives in the house right beside you. You, you want Hebrew and Greek and four hours of worship and you want me to confuse you with theology, but you aren't off first base yet, according to Jesus? No, 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 no. Why, why would we go into all that when we don't even have the basics now of love your neighbor as yourself? And here's the thing. The New Testament imperatives are examples of how to demonstrate your love for God by loving others. Everything you read... Matthew, all the way to Revelation, every bit of it is about how to do the thing that Jesus told us to do. Every bit of it are examples of how to love your neighbor and love God. And they're not for your benefit, though you will benefit. I have never met an angry, generous person. Your life will get better, but that's not the goal. And they're certainly not there for God's benefit. God is fine. God's not up there looking at our country and looking at our world, looking at your life, and looking over at Peter and Paul going, what are we going to do? It's a mess down there. I guess we got to rewrite all the, no, 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 he's fine. God's fine. It's not for his benefit. It's not for your benefit. It's for the benefit of the people that are in your life who God has placed in your life for you to love like he loved you. Okay, so if you're at home and you are watching online and you got me in one screen and you got Amazon in another one, you're looking at pillows, I need you to minimize Amazon and maximize me. I know you don't want to see my face that big, but just do it, all right? We're about to land the plane. Everybody in the room, if you're checking out when the, the game starts, the playoff game, it's at 2.05. You got plenty of time. Put your phone down, all right? So we're going to land the plane with a couple thoughts, and here's the first one. You got to pay attention. If you're going to write anything down, take any pictures of any points, this is it. The Jesus model is much less complicated than the temple model. But it is much more demanding. Don't ever forget this. At the epicenter of the Christian faith is a man that as people got closer to him, they believed he was from God. At the epicenter of the Christian faith is a man who as people got to know him better, those that knew him better actually believed he was the son of God, God in the flesh. At the epicenter of the Christian faith and the epicenter of Christian teaching is a man who died covered in his own blood in the spit of other men. That's what this looks like. That's how far this goes. That's what is required. It is much simpler. Love God. Love your neighbor. It is far more demanding. It's easy to find a place to hide in the temple model. Well, the Bible never says anything about it, so I guess we're good. Well, my, my interpretation of the, of the text about this particular thing is blah, 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 so we can do whatever we want because it never really says blah, blah, blah. Easy to find a loophole in there. Easy to find an escape clause in there, but you can't hide from things like Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. You can't hide from that. No escape clause in there. You can't hide from Jesus' words in Luke chapter 6, verse 27. But to you who are listening, I say, love your who, your enemies, your what, your who, your what, your, my who, my in, what? Yeah. Love your enemies. Not only that, do good to those who hate you. Who does that? Christians do. At least that's what Jesus taught, right? At least that's what Jesus wants. And this is why the Christian faith is so amazing. Love offers us no place to hide. There's no loopholes, no shortcuts, no workarounds in love. It's simple, but it's demanding. And it's summed up into one question. One question that I prayed for you about today. 
I prayed for you on the way to church, which is the good news. The bad news is I prayed that God would haunt you this week with this question. What does love require of me? This is the essence of Christianity right here. This is it. And the reality is if your marriage is struggling right now and you ask that question, you already know what to do, what you need to do. If you got tension with family, tension at work, tension on your team, if you got stress with anybody in your life right now, there's fracture, there's disconnect, you already know what to do. That's what makes following Jesus so simple but so tough. God's going to talk. You get to decide if you do what he says to do. And that's what it means to follow Jesus. Jesus stepped towards love. Jesus stepped towards blessing those who persecuted him. Jesus stepped towards giving his life away for people who aim to take his life. And I can't say as a Christ follower that I'm going to follow Jesus' steps if I turn around this way and I'm a racist or I'm greedy or I'm stingy or if my life's all about me. I'm walking away from Jesus if I live that way. What does love require of me? Now, I know what you're thinking. Some of you are thinking, now, this is just some watered-down, hippie, love-fest version of Christianity. I can't get with it. Just remember, when your heavenly father asked this question, it cost him his son. And when your savior asked him this question, it cost him his life. And then to you and me, he says, come follow me and answer the question. And everything else you'll ever be taught is just commentary. It's an example. It's an illustration of that right there. Could you imagine, could you imagine what our families would look like if we just did that? Could you imagine what our city, our church, our community would look like? Could you imagine a world where people were critical of us because they didn't agree with what we believed, but they were envy of us because of how we treated each other and our neighbors? That's the first century church. That's what happened in the first century church. And that is why the first century church grew. They had no Bibles. They had no buildings. They had no good-looking pastors. I know that. It's in history. Go study it. They were not good-looking. All they had was the teaching of Jesus. And that's all they needed. And the church thrived and grew. And I believe it can happen again. So you're listening and you say, okay, I'm tracking with you, Josh, but here's the thing. That's all about people. And that sounds real hedonistic. I know for a fact that we're supposed to talk about the glory of God. It's supposed to be. I've heard messages about it's all about the glory of God. What about God's glory and all this? What does God get out of all this? I'm glad you asked. I hope the words of Jesus haunt you and bother you as much as they bother me. Look at what he said in Matthew chapter 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, there's that word, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne, and the nations will be gathered before him, and he'll separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will come and say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Oh, I like that. I want to be blessed. That sounds real good. Anybody ready for my blessing? Come, take your inheritance. I love it, man. I never heard anybody get an inheritance and say it was a bad thing. This is really working out in my favor. You got my attention. The kingdom prepared for you. There's a kingdom prepared for me. Is this a Disney story, Jesus? This is incredible. From the creation of the world. Okay, I'm, I'm on pins and needles. What are you going to say next? Then. King said, for I was hungry. Wait a minute, he was hungry. I never saw him hungry. And you gave me something to eat. I never fed him. He took the loaves and the fishes. That wasn't us. I was thirsty. I never gave him any water. Did you give him any water? You gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. Wait a minute, I know his name. Don't you know his name? It's Jesus, right? Are we sure it's Jesus? So we've been living with the three. We're not strangers. What are you talking about? You invited me in. I needed clothes. Now, wait a minute, Jesus. I never saw you naked. You clothed me. I was sick. God can get sick. Now he's messing with our theology. 
You looked after me. I was in prison. He broke the law. What? And you came to visit me, to which some of us are thinking, no, Jesus, you're in church and I visit you there. You're in sacred building and I visit you there and I hear about you from sacred men teaching sacred texts. And I don't need you, I don't need for me to look after you, I need you to look after me. You got it backwards, Jesus, what are you talking about? In verse 37 it says, then, these are the words of Jesus, then the righteous will answer him. Righteous means those who are right with God. Then the righteous will answer him. Lord, when did we see your When did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison? Come to visit you. Was it when we were singing? When we pictured you, we felt we were close to you. Was it when we prayed? Was it, was it at summer camp, which is great, you should go? Was it a women's men, ministry or a men's Bible study event? When, when did we see you, Jesus? What are you talking about? Well, think about all those things. Who gets the most out of all those things? Me, right? The camp and the study and the service. This is me, right? Yeah. But the essence of following Jesus isn't about me, is it? Verse 40, the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. The Jesus model centers on the you besides you. And your devotion, your devotion to God is illustrated, demonstrated, and authenticated, proved to the world. By your love for others. Did I mention that if you mistreat one of my kids, that all the singing, all the generosity, and all the sucking up in the world won't make, make any of it, anything of it? Did I mention that the best way for you to honor me was to honor my kids? The best thing you could ever do for me is to not do anything for me, but to do something for Liam or Beckett Wright. It's kind of like... Whatever you do for one of them, it's like you're doing it for me. What if it was that simple? What if it was as simple as what does love require of me? And to honor God, I have to love you. And the harder you are to love, the more glory God gets when I actually love you. I'm telling you. If we got that right, it'd change our families. If we got that right, it'd change our workplaces, our communities, it'd change our schools, it'd change our clubs, our ball teams, it'd change everything. It's got the power to change the world. It did one time, it could do it again. What does love require of me is a statement that I'm about to pray haunts you all week. Father, in Jesus' name. Thank you so much that you answered that question and gave your life. What was required was sacrifice. What was required was the perfect, sinless, spotless Son of God laying down His life for the very ones who deserve to die, me being one of them. So thank you, Jesus, when you answered that question. I was on your lips. I was on your heart. I was the one that you spoke about. When you said, Father, forgive them, it was me. And so I pray for me and I pray for my friends, both here and at Compass at home. God, I pray that as we go about our week this week, that we wouldn't look for loopholes or escape clauses or ways out. That Jesus, we'd ask the question, what does love require of me when I go to work, when I'm with my kids, when I'm with my wife or my husband, God, that when I talk about, my, about politics and my country, when I treat people the way they should be treated, God, this week, when I look at people that are different than me, that think different than me, that vote different than me, when I look at people that mistreat me or that I would even call my enemy this week, Father, let me be like you. Jesus, let me be like you and answer the question, what would love require of me? By laying down my life and making it about them. I pray that my friends would be able to do the same. In Jesus' name.